He, he just graduated, or he just got his diploma uh, recently. So, but when he was younger, he was uh, maybe about six years old, and uh, I was cooking dinner. And he said, I'm hungry. I said, don't worry, brother. I'm going to cook you something mean. And he said, I'm hungry. What are you going to cook? And I said, I'm going to cook some chicken katsu. It was the first time I, I was going to cook chicken katsu, flour, egg, panko, right? And so I was like, OK, I'm going to cook some chicken katsu. And it's going to be mean. And so I'm all happy and cooking up my, my chicken katsu, right? And then his whole countenance kind of changed. And he was kind of like, oh my gosh. And I, and I looked at him and I said, hey, what's the matter? And he said, oh, and he started to cry, oh, I like cats. I'm like, that's so random. You know, what are you talking about cats for? And what are you crying for? And he's like, oh, I'm not hungry. I said, what do you mean you're not hungry? You just told me you're hungry. I told you I'm making chicken katsu. And now you're crying and telling me you're not hungry and that you love cats. And I was like, that makes zero sense. What are you talking about? He said, oh, I like cats and I'm not hungry. I don't want to eat your food. I said, why not? And he said, I don't want to eat cats. And I said, I didn't say we're going to eat cats. He said, yes, you said we're going to eat chicken cat soup. And I said, no, there's not chicken cat soup. There's no such thing that, that I know of about chicken cat soup. We're going to eat chicken katsu and it's going to be mean. And, and so he, he wasn't convinced that all night long he just kind of ate the chicken katsu with like his other cats in here, you know? And so he heard wrong and he believed wrong. And um, we, see, we see that happen all the time. You know, when people are, are, are giving messages and they're saying things that are not necessarily right. And so we want to be sure that we hear from God and we hear from him accurately because he's always speaking to us. He's always trying to say something to you. He's always trying to lead you somewhere. He's trying to bring you closer to himself. And so we need to be able to hear the Lord accurately. How many of you would agree that we need to hear the Lord accurately? Amen? Amen. We absolutely need to. And so I hope as well that when you come to church and as we assemble like this, that we are prepared and that our hearts are kind of postured just to hear something from the Lord. And so when we walk out, we're thinking, man, you know what? God spoke to me. There's something that I need to do. There's something that I need to change. There's something in my life I need to kind of upgrade. Whatever it is, and it just kind of draws us closer to the Lord. And I hope that's why we all come to church, um, to just hear a word from the Lord. And some of us have heard wrong messages at church. Some of us have heard wrong messages at church. And so sometimes, even like when I'm um, preaching or, or giving a message, it may, it may contradict or may feel like it kind of rubs against some of the things that we've heard in the past from church. And I do understand that. And uh, I just need to let you know that I'm just here to tell you what the Bible says, okay? And so some of the messages um, that we hear are, are things like, God loves you when? God loves you when you do a good job. God loves you when you always obey your parents. And God loves you like when, you, when you're doing well and you're not breaking the rules. You're, you're not sinning when God loves you. But if you sin and you're not, you're not obeying the law, then God doesn't love you. Yeah, wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Also things like, you know, God will hear your prayers. God hears your prayers when you're righteous and you do right all the time and that you just do everything perfect. You live a perfect life, then you pray, God will hear you. Yeah, we'll do it like that. Absolutely wrong. All those things are wrong. And so we, we want to understand that um, we're not here as, as well. We want to preach the, the message of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone accurately so that you know that Jesus loves you, period. Jesus loves you. and He loved you before you were even born, before you ever sinned, before you did anything wrong. He already loved you. And he already took care of all the sins that you have ever committed or that you are going to commit even in the future. Um, and I know I talk about this every, 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 every so often, and it does pop up a few questions, you know, things like, oh, so what you're saying is like, if I sin, I can just go out sinning, doing whatever I want to do, if, if that's what the message that you're saying to me. And that's not, that's not what I'm saying as well. We are against sin. Please hear me. We, we do not pro, um, promote sin in anybody's life. We want you to live a righteous and holy life. But what that's birthed out of is from God's grace and God's love. God loves us, God's grace is upon us, and then it causes us to live a life of holiness. Not fear and trembling in the sense of that God is going to kill you or like stab you or kill your kids or any kind of ridiculous things like that. And we're so afraid, now I'm going to live holy. No. So we need to understand those things, and we're going to continue going through this um, 
as often as we can, just so we can understand God. And I really believe, and so I want to just kind of put this out there as well. We believe here in miracles. Do you believe in miracles? Yes. We believe in miracles. We believe in, in God's power. We believe that what God's word says is true. And that when we believe the Lord and speak his words, the things that he says will happen, will indeed happen. We obviously know that it doesn't always happen in churches where you know, people stand on faith because it's hard to pray for somebody who will walk up to you and say, I only have five days to live. You know, the doctor said I'm going to die in five days. And then for us to lay hands and pray for them and say, you know what? I don't care what the doctor says. I only care what the Bible says. And this is what the Bible says. And just to pray that prayer of faith. And on top of that, I could say, I'm going to pray for this person. How many of you would believe me? And everybody would say, like, yeah, I believe you. And then I would say, then why don't you come down and come and pray for this person? And then we'll be like, oh, that's okay. You pray. I don't want to pray, you know? And so we want to get to a place where we all believe where we all believe God's power is real. We all believe the word of God and we stand upon it. And I believe in that atmosphere, when once that happens, when we believe what the Bible says and not what we feel, think, hear, smell, taste, or feel, whatever, and just believe what God's word says, that these things will take place. I do realize as well that it's kind of big claims. You know, it's like, oh, wow, big claims you got over there. You know, claiming of miracles and all these kind of things. So I like see, and that's the attitude of some of us. I understand that as well. But um, we're just here to preach the Word of God, and uh, we're going to see the results that the Word of God has for us. And uh, we're just praying for all of us to believe together. Can we do that? Can will we do that together? Amen? Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so we want to we um, not only be... Uh, this, this is something too I want to I mention real quick too. When it comes to church stuff, and when it comes to hearing from God, it's not necessarily only to make you good. Okay, in fact, it's not really even to make you good. So people always say to me, oh, you know, can you talk to my husband? Because he really could use some help. You know, he needs to like, you know, he needs to be a better husband. He needs to listen better. He needs to be a better father. He needs to pray. He needs to do all these things. Keep you, can you talk to him so he's good? Because right now he's not so good. Or can you talk to my son? Because he needs to be good because he's not so good. But I want to say something to you. Jesus Christ didn't come to earth to make bad people good. Jesus Christ came to earth to make dead people alive. That's a big, big difference. And when we're alive to the Lord, when we can hear God speak to us, and we become alive to that, and what, and what He says is how we feel like this, and we, we just resonate with what His character is, what He says, what He does, etc., then we start to have heaven on earth, and that's the kind of people that we want to be. So we want to be alive to the Lord, which means we want to live lives of faith. And if we're going to live lives of faith, we're going to have faith. What does the Bible tell of us in uh, Romans ten seventeen That faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. Amen. And by the way, um, if you're wondering if you need to speak to the Lord, you need to call him up, his telephone number, um, in case any of you were wondering what the Lord's phone number was, is uh, Jeremiah 33, 3. Did we have that up? Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Let's uh, call upon the Lord right now. Can we bow our heads? Lord, we call upon you right now, Lord, as your children. Father, believing that you can hear us, believing that you hear our call and that you would speak to us blessings, that you would speak to us about our future, that you would speak hope into us, that you would just de deposit life into us so that as we walk in our lives, Lord, that we could just believe you and receive the very best that you have for us. We pray this morning, Lord, that you would give us those ears to really hear you. We speak against any kind of demonic force that would try to speak against us or rob this word. We speak against it right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We posture our hearts and our ears to hear a word from you. Give us the hearts to respond in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to just um, say one more, give one more testimony. I got a call a few nights ago, and a good friend of mine was calling, and uh, he was in Oahu. Uh, when we started planting this church, some of, the, some of our, our sisters got pregnant that the doctor said in the past, you'll never get pregnant. You know, you might as well adopt because you're never going to get pregnant. And, you know, they've been trying for years and years. And this particular couple got pregnant and they had a baby and so they're so blessed but he called, my friend called me um, a few nights ago and he said I just wanted to tell you that um, 
I'm so blessed that I'm, I'm here on, on, on Oahu. I said, okay, you're on Oahu, great. And he said, I just want you to know that I've always been praying for my family, and I want to minister to my family and tell them about Jesus. So I'm so thankful that we're here um, on Oahu because I'm always trying to minister to my family. But he was crying, and his, his voice was kind of shaky, so I knew something was wrong. I said, okay, you well, we want to minister to your family. That's great. And then he said, the reason why I'm here on Oahu is because my son was sick when we were in Maui. And uh, he started leaning, he started leaning to one side. And he's just a baby, so just not even one years old yet. He's just, just a little guy. And the baby started leaning to one side, and they thought, oh, you know, it's just a, an ear infection or something like that. And uh, they took the baby to the doctor, and the doctor said, oh, no, the baby's okay, teething and some stuff like that. So if it's still going on tomorrow, come back. The next day, it was worse. They went to the hospital here, and uh, the doctors then sent the baby to Oahu to get better treatment, better x-rays, etc. And when the baby got to Oahu, the doctors, everybody started saying, something is wrong with your child. And so he had to fly up to, to Oahu. And on his way there, when he got there, he called me and he started you know, shaking and said, you know, I always wanted to minister to my family. And I think that's why I'm here. Because God is doing this to my son, who's about ready to apparently to die. But it's going to give me the opportunity to witness to my family. And now I can tell them about Jesus and tell them about being a disciple because I know it's so important to tell them about stuff like that. And I want to I want to minister to my family, but I love my son. And I just heard a message that if worse comes to worse, I'll meet my son in heaven. And I know all those things. And so he just started talking about all this kind of stuff, right? And so I stopped him. And I said, brother, please hear me. Please listen to me. The reason why you are in Oahu is not so you can talk to your family and have them be disciples, which is great. We want to minister to people, absolutely. But the reason that you're there is to speak life over your son and to just claim and declare healing in Jesus' name. You know the Lord and you're born again. When you're born again, one third of you is full of the Holy Spirit, that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so I started speaking to him and ministering to him. And then I prayed for him. We prayed over his son. And so he, he felt better. He felt better. But apparently what happened is when they went to Oahu, the doctor said that something was really wrong with the child. And that um, he, for whatever reason, didn't have too much hope that the child would make it um, for the next few days. And so I prayed with him. And I said, no, we're going to believe on God's word. And don't believe anything else, okay? People might come and have some kind of like weird prayers or do some different stuff. You're the father. You take authority. Anything that's not of the Lord, get rid of it speak life into your child amen amen and so he so he he did that and um you know we prayed for him and um and i, I just want to i just want to report to you that this morning i heard back from him and he was just blessed he's like praise god my son is healed and all these miracles happen and all this kind of you know and it it was it's just a confirmation not of anything that I, oh, I, I say the right things or you hear the right things it's just a confirmation that god's word is true it's as simple as that. God's word is true. Do we believe it? And do we exercise it? Do we practice it? Or do we read about it, hear about it at church, and then just cross our fingers when we're praying? Oh, I hope so, I hope so, I hope so, I hope so. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? The hope so salvation and the no so salvation. You need to know. We need to know that God is on your side, that he hears you, that he listens to you. And we need to be able to hear him as well. So, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, hearing the Lord, okay? So we're going to, um, we're going to read out of a story from Genesis 3, and uh, because we need to learn how to hear from God, each and every one of us, we also need to be aware that there's an enemy to your soul who will try to rob, steal, kill, and destroy everything that the Lord will plant into your heart, okay? So we need to be mindful of that, and we're going to read out of Genesis 3, um, verses 1, and so I'll, I'll read... I'll read through this, and then um, we'll just kind of, can we, can we put it up on the screen? We're reading out of the new um, King James, okay? So here we go, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, 
you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Oh, right. We're going to get into this. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just um, speak to us this morning as we get into your word and that we hear a word from you, Lord. Uh, we, I just pray, Father, that you would really give us ears to hear you and that we thank you for your presence that is already here. We know that you have a message for our hearts and we just receive it. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, here we, we hear from the enemy, the enemy of your soul, which we read about is a serpent. The serpent that we read about in the Bible is not just some, some person or some entity that had happened in the beginning of time, but he's still here today. And he knows your name, he knows your phone number, he knows your location, he knows everything about your family, everything about your family line, and he's out to, to get us. And I, I don't mean to scare us like a boogeyman, but we just need to be mindful that there is an enemy against you who does not want God's best for you in your life. So we just need to let you know that, okay? And so let's take a look at, um, now the serpent was more cunning than any other beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, one thing that the devil will always do to you is question what God told you. God will give you a promise. God will give you direction. God will say, this is something that you need to do. And you'll say, great, that, uh, that's wonderful. I'll do it. And then two weeks later, you start asking yourself, or actually sometimes it's another voice that says, is that really what God said to do? Should you really, I mean, really, you're going to treat your husband like that, even though he's a jerk? I mean, really, that's what you're going to do? Like, and, and the Lord two weeks ago said, you know what, just love your husband. Love your husband and let God change him. But two weeks go by, he doesn't change, and then all of a sudden this voice says, has God really said to treat him well? Or whatever it is, right? We always hear that voice, and the enemy will always try to deceive you and rob what God has already spoken. And this is what God had said. And uh, we read out of um, Genesis 2. Um, well, anyway, let's, let's continue. First of all, absolutely, the enemy will try to rob God's word from, your, from you, okay? And then um, Eve says, We may eat of the fruit of the trees from the gar of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Um, God didn't say that you couldn't touch it. But apparently Adam, when Adam was telling Eve about what God said, he added his own little regulations as well. He said, don't eat the tree. In fact, don't even touch the tree. So that's what he said to Eve, okay? That's not what God said. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Okay? Now let's take a look at what God said. And we read out of um, Genesis 2. Um, let me see where we're at. Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden... You may freely eat. Let's stop right there. So first of all, Satan says, did God really say that you cannot eat from the tree or from, from this garden here? And God has actually said, you can eat all of this stuff. You are so blessed. This is all the blessings that you have. But the enemy will come and say like, did God really say that you could have all these blessings? When blessings in your life that you, you know you deserve or you know that you would receive that you pray for, God wants to bless you. But there's a voice that says, does God really want to give you a new job? I mean, you screwed up the last couple jobs. I mean, does God really want to give you a new job? Does God really want to heal your child? Because you know what? You don't, you don't, you don't follow the rules or you're just, whatever it is, and that's the enemy speaking to you. God has this abundance and he's blessed them with it. He blesses you with it. And the enemy of your soul will say, is that what God really wants for you? Okay? And so this is, this is what the Lord says, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. And there's a reason for that. We'll get to that in just a second, why God puts these boundaries. And then the Lord says, For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what God says. And this is what the enemy says. You will not surely die. God says, You will surely die. Satan says, you will not surely die. So we see immediately, liar, liar, pants on fire, right? That guy is just a liar. Now he's just coming straight against God's word and just saying like, no, you're not going to die. You're going to be fine. 
And um, no can. We cannot be listening to the Lord. I mean, to the... Always be listening to the Lord. We gotta be listening to the snake like that, okay? So you will not surely die. And, and God says, for the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in something real quick in here um, to explain. We're gonna glean a few little messages as we're talking about hearing from God. And the first one is that, um, for in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Did Adam and Eve eat of the fruit eventually? Yes, they, they did. Did they die that day? They didn't die that day because we know they didn't die that day because they lived for hundreds of years later, right? So we know that they didn't drop dead that day. But did they die that day is the question. And the answer is actually yes. They died spiritually, okay? And this is where we, we pick up the, the lesson of spirit, soul, and body. So we're going we're gonna to just throw that in here um, today. And uh, the... Spirit, soul, and body. How many of you know that you're made up of three parts? Okay, not too many of us, but this is what the Bible says, okay? In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That scripture uh, basically says that you are made up of three parts. We understand that God is a triune God, that He's made up of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And people have a hard time understanding that um, in evangelism, where we're trying to tell people about God. That's one of the issues people have. Like, wait, how can God be God the Father, and then God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit? It doesn't make sense. How do you, you know, reconcile that? And the best example that I have to explain three in one is just time. There's past, present, and future. And they're all three completely separate things. However, they all exist in the same time. And they all move at the same time. So when I just started this message 10 minutes ago, that was the past, right? And now we're standing in the present. But let's give it two seconds. Now that was the past, okay? So, so we understand that time is moving. It's, it's three completely different things, but they're all joined together at one point, okay? And that's how God, God is. He's a triune God. That's how God made us. We're a three-part person. And the reason why we need to understand this and understand that that's the part of us that died when, when Adam and Eve ate is because in 2 Corinthians 5.17, this is a, a scripture that just jacked me all the time. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay, that's what the Bible says. And when I'm sitting in church and the preacher says, Behold, all things have become new. You know, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Everybody's all like, Amen! Yeah, Amen! And I'm thinking to myself, Wait, I'm, I'm still the same. Like, I'm still the same knucklehead. I still have the same issues. I still have the same desires to sin and all this kind of stuff. Like, I don't feel like I'm brand new what's going on you know you look in the mirror you still weigh the same you still have you know hair or no hair pimples etc if you were ugly before you got saved you'll be ugly after you got saved you know and so it's just what is it that changed about me i'm still the same and that's why if we don't understand spirit soul and body you'll never understand that the spirit part of you is that part of you that got born again okay so the spirit soul and body that's the part of us that died when Adam and Eve sinned. And when God said that you will die, you will surely die on this day, that is a part that died. And that's why that part died and they got crushed, but they still lived. They still lived. They walked on earth, but their spirit was dead. And that's why we need to be born again because we walk on earth, but until our spirit is born again, then, then we're, we're dead, right? Then that's why, that's why we go to hell. And, um, you know, it's, it's important for us to remember that People don't go to hell, and I know that even that word hell, now these are church, you know, some places, they don't even say that word because it's like so controversial, you know, like, how dare you say hell? But the Bible says it all the time, Jesus says it, so we say it, okay? And, and the thing about hell is that people don't go to hell because of sin. Yes, they do. No, people don't go to hell because of sin. People go to hell because they have not received Jesus Christ as their redeemer of the sins that we commit. Every single one of us, how many of you are going to heaven? If you're born again, we have received Jesus Christ, we'll all go to heaven, okay? How many of you have sinned? Yep, again, everybody's hands should go up again. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, that's what ushers us in, into the, into the throne room, into God's presence. 
So it's not sin that, that, that kills us or, or sin that causes us to go to hell. It's not receiving Jesus Christ. There's a big difference there. So please, if we could remember that. And so anyway, that's a spirit, soul, and body. That's, a, that's something that, um, that we want to notate. We want to note that um, in the story of uh, Adam and Eve and as they, as they sin in the garden. And that they indeed did die that day, but they're still physically alive walking around on earth. Just like many of our family members, many of us, how we were, walking around on earth, but really inside, dead, and not alive to the Lord. Amen? And in fact, when we get baptized, and when we do baptisms, that's what it's about. So we'll go through a teaching for all those who are going to get baptized, that what it represents when we get baptized, you don't just go get wet and go for a swim. Okay, what we're doing is we're saying that I believe in Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. So when I'm baptized, I go under the water, which represents myself and my flesh and everything dirty, and my, my spirit that's been dead, that that part of me is dead. And when I come out of the water, I've been raised with Christ. I've been raised with Christ. And it's now not me who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And that's how I live my life. And so that's the representation of baptism, that there's an inner change inside of us, and that we just go through this outer... Um, outer, ex not outer body experience, but this is outer experience, and that's what baptism represents. It's just, it just represents what's going on in the inside of us, okay? So, let's move on. Um, gen uh, let me see, 3, 4, okay? Genesis 3, 4, we're gonna, we're gonna take it to the next verse here. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, lie for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Another one of the tricks of the enemy is that he will always try to tempt you to getting something more than what you have already been blessed with. So many of us are blessed with just an abundant life. We have wonderful families, wonderful children. But for whatever reason, we can have a great life, and all of a sudden, there could be, like, let's say, at the office, there's somebody who starts a, 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 you know, a new position in the office across the street or whatever, and she looks pretty good, you know, she's young and she, she's smart and every time you start talking to her and then there, all of a sudden there's kind of like this, this flirtiness going on and, uh, you know, we have wives, we have children, we're blessed, we're blessed, but for whatever reason, in our minds we hear this like, yeah, but that's, that's good, the family stuff is good, but wow, check out, look at her and she's looking at you, woohoo, you know, and maybe you can score or whatever, right? And that's... That's when the enemy will kill you, kill your family, and kill everybody's future just because of that one extra thing. I just want to experience that. I just want to try that. And it's wrong. And so that, that I know many of you understand what I'm talking about, um, whether it's that person at the office or person who, who you know, in, in our businesses, you know, we always see somebody and we talk with them and there's that kind of like flirty feel and it's like, wow, you know, I really feel good when I'm around you. All that stuff is, beware of that. The enemy will take advantage of that and he will kill and destroy your family just with a stupid relationship that is inappropriate. And so stay away. So hear her, be warned, okay? Please, 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 please. And you know what, which person I'm talking about. If you think about it right now, your spouse may not know, your friends may not know, your kids may not know, but you know who I'm talking about. There's that person that somewhere that just kind of like gets your attention and you get that person's attention and it's like, yeah, it feels good to be around you and stuff like that. Cancel. Get rid of it. In Jesus' name. Okay? All right. So, so the enemy says, be, you will be just like, you will be just like God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, again, those are the, our eyes now looking at things, looking at things instead of, Looking to the Lord, our eyes are looking. Our eyes are looking at pleasant things, and we're like, "Yeah, I want, I want, I want some of that. I want that fruit." And then, uh, let me see. And the tree desirable to make, um, and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And again, that that making you wise kind of thing. Recently, I've heard a lot of younger people um, telling me that the one thing that they're after is experience. They're like, yeah, it's going to make me more experienced, so I'm going to, like, do this with that person. What are you talking about? That's not right. You don't want to do that. Yeah, but I'm going to have more experience. And my friends are doing all these things, and I've never done bad stuff like that. And I'm not a bad person, but, man, imagine the experience. And people are chasing experiences, just random weird experiences, just to kind of, like, add to their Batman belt of like, I've done this, I've done that, I've tried this, I've tried that. 
and again, those are all from the enemy. The enemy will use that to, to take you down. And you know, some of the kids nowadays too, they're, you know, the, um, the teenagers, they're, they're taking pictures of themselves and sending it to people. Like, oh, look, look how nice I look, or look how pretty I am, all these kind of things. And you have no idea that that digital image of you will last for as long as we have a digital world. It, that image of you will, will last forever. So we have to train our children the importance of the things that we're putting up on the internet. You know, of course, the whole Facebook thing with um, your profile and like, you know, you want to get a good job, you have a great education, but on your Facebook page is a picture of you with a beer, like all kind of crazy stuff going on. And it's just destructive, so destructive. So our children need to learn that it's not the experience that, that we're chasing after, we're just chasing after the Lord. And when we chase after the Lord, He will give you a better experience than you ever could on your own. All right? So, um, let's see. Let's move on to the next. The enemy, let me say this too. The enemy tactics, okay? You know where the enemy is trying to tempt, um, trying to tempt Eve and say, did God really say that? That is, a, that is the number one tactic, the number one tactic that Satan will use against you. He used that against Adam and Eve, or he used that against Eve, and Eve bit, and she, and she um, did what she did, sin, etc. But Satan also tried this on Jesus. And so we take a look at Matthew 4.1. Okay, we take a look at Matthew 4.1 and see what... Um, did you do it to uh, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. So this is after, this is after he, he's baptized and God comes down and he says, this is my beloved son. And so Jesus gets now um, led by the Spirit to be tempted in the, in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when, he, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, stop. Satan, will, he's already countering what God had already said. God will say stuff to you, and then Satan will come in and say, did God really say, are you really a child of God? Because here we read in uh, Matthew 3, 17, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? A few days later, Satan walks up to Jesus and says, if you are the Son of God, you know, then, then turn this, this stone into, into bread. And, and by turning the stone into bread, Jesus could have turned the stone into bread and ate it if he wanted to. But it's the fact that it's proving to Satan, like, yeah, I am the Son of God. Watch me do this. And Jesus says, no, I'm the Son of God because of what he already said. I'm not the Son of God because I can do all these little tricks for you, mister. I'm the Son of God because of what God said. That's something that we need to hear as well. You are a child of God because He said so. You are blessed because He said so. Amen. There's hope for you because He said so. Amen. He has a plan and a future for you because He said so. We have to stand upon that and not because, oh yeah, I have a plan, like, like look at all these things. And, it, and it's not. So that, again, just the enemy of the, ta the enemy tactics, that's what He'll use against us. And that's what we see in Scripture that He used against Adam and Eve, and He tried to use that against Jesus. And Jesus, with the word of God, um, just completely just devoured the enemy. The enemy was dust. And then Jesus said, yeah, I'm done talking to you. You know, get lost. Beat it. And so that's what happened. All right. And so the enemy will say things like this. You don't need rules. Rules are, you, you know, um, you don't need rules because rules are bad. You don't need restrictions because restrictions are bad. You should be able to be free and do whatever you want. And that's why, that's why God said, don't eat this one tree. This one tree, don't eat that, right? And we need to understand something. God gives us boundaries. God gives us restrictions. Not to harm you, not to hurt you, but to help you. To grow in you a heart that will be obedient to the Lord. And uh, I thought, you know, who better than Pastor Wayne to explain this um, for us. So we have a video. <laughs> He's not going to pop up <laughs> over, the, over, the, over, the, over the wall or anything like that. But um, we're going to have a video with uh, Pastor Wayne just kind of telling us about boundaries and restrictions. Um, are we good with that, James? Okay. Can we get the lights, please? And uh, let's have Pastor Wayne minister to us. Some of you, when you first come to Christ, you'll think this Christian stuff is just so constricting. Just way too constricting. Why is it so constricting? Look at Deuteronomy. Very restricting. Why? Why? Because he wants us to change our hearts. <laughs> Explain that to us. Here it is. 
When Aaron was growing up, he got in a tussle with Amy. And he just went crazy. He went ballistic. And he wanted to punch her. He wanted to kick her. He wanted to bite her. And when I came home, he was just about ready to go nuts. So, yeah, and I just grabbed him like this. And I held him really tight. I said, no, you're not going to do it. And a little arm popped up. I want to hit her. And a little leg, boom, I want to kick her. And just little things coming, popping out. And I just held him. I said, no, no, you just settle down. No, I hate her. I hate her. I said, no, you don't. And I hate you. Let me go. I hate you. No, you don't. Daddy loves you. No, I hate you. And I hate mom. I hate everybody. I said, no. And I just held him really tight. This is when he was like 19 or so. And <laughs> And I just held him really tight like this. And I, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. But daddy loves you. I hate you, I hate everybody. And I just, let me go, let me go, let me go. And he cried and cried. And said, no, no, dad just going to hold you until you settle down. And he just kept crying and fighting. And I just held him, I just held him really tight. And finally he settled down and I heard him, his cry even changed. Got a deeper cry. And I said, are you all right now? Daddy loves you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, you all right now? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, Daddy's going to let you go. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Once his heart changed, I could what? Loosen up that which was so constricting. But why did I hold him tight? It was to change his heart. If I let him go, he would have destroyed our house. <laughs> and his sister would have kicked the stuffings out of him. <laughs> For his own protection, I held him. And if he were let go when his heart was still off, the next morning he would be so sorry. Because the relationship will have broken down. But I held him really close because I hated him, no, because I loved him. And I wanted to change what? His heart first. And watch this. Once his heart changed, what could I do then? I could let him go. Because it was his heart. I wanted his heart to change first. Listen very carefully. All right. Yeah, can we tell him thank you? Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? So that's, that's what God is after when, when he gives us these restrictions. He's just after our hearts. So if we, can, if we can have the heart to serve the Lord, in fact, the Bible tells us that when we're under grace, there is no law. There's no law for a person who loves all the time, who's filled with joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. When you have all those things, you live a life for God, and God can release all, all these restrictions. There's no like law over you. But, but for us, like when we have these restrictions, when we get started, it's not to hurt us. It's just so that we can be conformed to the Lord. And as soon as, as, soon as the Lord knows that He has our hearts, then He starts to, then he starts to release us. So that's why, that's why we have this um, the particular, um, not only passage, but we see that in just through God's themes. He does tell us to do certain things. He tells us not to do certain things. And the reason why He says not to do certain things is not because He hates us, but because He's trying to protect us from ourselves sometimes. So we want to understand that. Um, and let's move on. Okay, so Genesis um, 3, 6, and 7. Sorry, I lost my... 3, 6, and 7. Uh, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, so let's, let's move on to the next, um, to the next verse. Then the eyes of both of them were open, okay? And remind and may I remind you that um, before this, they thought they were going to be wise. They thought they were going to be just like God. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to take some of this fruit. I'm going to be just like God. It's going to be awesome. And that's what we do sometimes too. Satan says, yeah, take this, take this. It's going to be awesome. And this is what happens. Um, and, they, and their eyes were open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. That knowing that they were naked, what happened is in the very beginning, or not the very beginning, but in Genesis 2, God says that they were walking around naked. Okay, and they, they, I'll read this, I'll read this to you as soon as I find it. So, there we go. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, so that's how God made them, that's what was going on. They were both naked, and they weren't ashamed. 
But the moment that they sinned, the moment that they partook, the moment that they listened to the to the enemy and didn't hear God well, and they partook of it thinking that they were going to be wise, immediately there was this shame that came upon them. And so they got duped. They got totally jacked by that. So they didn't become wiser. They didn't become better. They didn't become more like God in that sense that they, there's just this shame now that has come upon them. All right? And... Um, this is, and so this is a really interesting part that, that we uh, like to share. So what they did is, as they felt this shame and as they felt this, this guilt, what they did was they got fig leaves and they strung it together like a lay. And they just wrapped it around themselves to cover themselves up. Now, in, in Bible college, they teach us this, this word. It's called hermeneutics. And what that is is Bible interpretation by using the Bible. It's just different, different uh, ways of interpreting God's word. And there's a law that's called the law of first mention. And this is the first time that fig leaves are mentioned in the Bible. And what that fig leaves represent is self-righteousness or man's attempt to cover themselves up. Man's attempt to make things right because of what they've done. And that's what the fig leaves represent. Later on in the Gospels, we read that Jesus looked at a fig tree. Okay, So he saw this fig tree. He's seen that there was a leaf, but there was no figs on it. And what did Jesus do? He actually cursed it. He cursed it, it died at its very root. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we're like, what's up with figs and fig trees? And like, why did Jesus curse that fig tree and all that kind of stuff? And it's not until we understand that that fig leaf or that fig tree, anything dealing with figs, deals with our own self-righteousness, our own attempt to make things right, our own way of being reconciled to God. And God says, you it's never going to be good enough. And that's why we understand that we have a need for Jesus, who's done all the work for us. Okay? So in Genesis um, 3.9, we're, we're going we're gonna to continue on here. Genesis 3.9, and out of the... And, oh, sorry. Genesis 3.9. Um, then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? This is after they sinned, okay? So they, they both took the they both took the um, the fruit, the sin, shame. They put self righteousness on them using the figs. But then God comes back into the picture, and then He says, "Then the Lord God called to Adam, and He said to him, Where are you?'" And that question, "Where are you?" is not because God didn't know where they were. It wasn't because God uh, couldn't find them, like they were playing hide and go seek, like, "Hey, like, where are you guys at?" It was actually a question that God asks to us as well, and He says. Where are you? You know, where are we at with all these things? Where are you? And we have to have a, a, a good answer to that. We, and we don't want to be hiding from God. Because a lot of us were hiding from God. A lot of us were, were, were just kind of like, I'm going to hide from God. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to like be around like churchy people. And I have all these things that I've done. And so now I'm going to like hide from God. But does God stay away and like shoot slingshots at you? No. God shows up and he says... Where you at? Right? He's like, where are you? And so um, Adam goes on and he, and he just continues to hurt the Lord. And he says, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. You know, for me, I have children and I love them. And if I ever said like, where are you at? Right? And my daughter said, oh, I heard your voice. And I ran away <laughs> and I hid from you. You know, it just, it would break my heart. Just think it would break your heart as well. And that's what God is asking us. He's asking you, where are you? You know, where are you in, 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 in what God has called you to? Where are you? And we don't want to say, like, oh, I'm afraid of you. I'm going to go hide myself. And, and um, so anyway, Adam says this. He says that he was naked. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And this is one of my favorite parts of this whole passage of Scripture. And he said, God said, who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? And I could substitute so many things in there in our own lives. What God says, who told you that? We say, you know what, I, I love my, my marriage, but it's just not going to work. And God says, who told you that? You know, I, I can't be a good father because my father didn't take care of me. I don't know what it's like to be a good father. So like, now I'm raising the kids the best I can, but I'm never going to be a good godly father. Who told you that? Because God says that he'll be the father to the fatherless and he will raise you up himself. But the thing is, who told you that? Sometimes we have these addictions that we are trying to deal with, and we say, like, I'm never going to be able to break this addiction because my great-grandfather my great -grandfather had it, my grandpa had it, my dad has it, now I got it. I'm just stuck with this, and I'm never going to break this. Who told you 
that. That's what God is saying. Who told you that? Because you need to listen to the word of God. And the Bible tells us that where the spirit is, there is liberty, that there is freedom. And so when we have the Lord inside of us, we can break all these bondages. But we're told all this kind of trash all the time. And we believe what other people say. And we're not hearing the Lord. And so the Lord says, who told you that? And so we can continue to go on. You know, my marriage is falling apart. My kids are never going to change because look at them. I mean, I'll pray for them and I hope that God will change them and, and make them good kids. But man, you see how they are? They're just like their father. You know, they're, they're never going to, they're never going to change. And, and God says, who told you that? You know, and sometimes it's even our parents. I know people now who, who are like, can we pray for my parents? Because they're just kind of like out there. They don't know God. They only have so much time. We want Jesus to, to speak to them. But I just, you know what? I'm just kind of giving up hope. I don't think they're ever going to change. And again, God says, who told you that? We have to have this hope in God that he can make all these things happen. That he can raise dead people from the ground. He could, he could heal body parts or just have all these healings. We have to hear him and believe him. Not hear other people and believe them. Hear God and believe Him. Amen? Amen. That's, that's, a, that's some um, really important stuff that we want to be able to live our lives through and, and really get that together. All right? So, who told you that? Who told you that? Who told you that? So, we want to, number one, this is, this is um, some of the, we're going to come to a close. We're going we're gonna to take communion in just a minute. But if anything that you have heard this morning, I hope that you, number one, we get the message that you need to hear God, and you need to hear God accurately, okay? And what we do here is we teach um, life journaling, and uh, if you've never um, started life journaling, or you've heard about it, or you want to start, we have these life journals. They're $8 for one, and what we do is there's a reading plan, and we read through the entire Council of God's Word. Every year we go through the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice. How many of you are life journaling right now? Great, everybody. Wonderful. Okay, so we, um, we life journal, and as we read God's word, God speaks to us. And if we're hearing, God really starts to speak to us. And we write down these things. Lord, this is what I hear you saying to me. Lord, because of what you said today, this is how I'm going to change my life. This is how I'm going to, you know, re recorrect, recalibrate my brain so that I can think more like you live more like you, see people that you see them, love others as you love them. And God will God will use this to speak to you and we want to encourage it. So it's $8 for one. We'll have them for sale um, after after service. If you don't have $8 and you want a life journal, just take it. I'll take an IOU and if you never give the money to us, just fill up. <laughs> just read the Bible and fill it up. And, and we'll, we'll, call it, we'll call it even. We just really want to get these into your hands. And we really want you to just um, get into the word of God. And hear the word of the Lord, right? And um, the second, so the first thing is we hope that you hear God. And that you would spend time with the Lord and hear him. And the second thing that we want to encourage you to do this morning is to uh, stop talking to snakes. Okay? <laughs> Too many of us are talking to snakes. And you know, if you just think about it, you say, man, I know some of these snakes. And they're the kind of people that when you get around them, you just almost you feel weaker. Your body kind of feels like, oh, man. And that's not your wife or your husband, okay? That's not the person who the story is told of, of this, this pastor's wife. And the, pastor, the pastor's wife um, Facebooks the whole church and says, Dear church, please pray for my husband, your pastor. He has a terminal illness. It's called getting on my last nerve. Please pray for him as he may not make it through the night, right? It's not it's not it's not it's not your it's not your it's not your spouse. It, it, but really, there are people in your life that are kind of snakes. They're kind of like anchors, they kinda like weigh you down. And when you start speaking life and you start speaking like I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna believe God, and they're the kind of people who say, yeah, but, you know, how do you have another kid? It's so expensive. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? All that kind of stuff. And so those are kind of like the snakes in your life. And we want to just kind of like stop those conversations. And that's why we come to church. So we can have fellowship with people who believe as we believe. And so when people are trying to start a business, you know, you don't want to hang around people who are like, well, wow, it's hard, you know. Now, we need the money for that. How are you going to do that? It's, I mean, you know, you need to do all these kind of things. And they're just so negative. You want to be around people who say, yeah. You can do it. They'll just applaud you and say, go ahead and do it. God bless you. God's with you. You can do all things, you know. And that's the kind of people that we want to be, not only hang around with. So hear from God, 
stop talking to snakes, okay? And let's, um, let's finish this, this up with um, this one thing, and it comes from uh, Genesis 3, uh, 12 and 13. Um, well, actually, no, we're going to, we're going to, 3.21, let's just go there. And so after all these things happened, right, um, Adam and Eve ate of, the, ate of the tree, God actually gave him this punishment. He, he, he gave punishment to the serpent, he gave something to the woman, and he gave something to the man. Just, just for that kind of punishment. But in God's mercy and in God's grace, this is what he did in verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Because they were naked now, right? And they knew that they were naked, so they used all these fig leaves. So God said, yeah, cancel the fig leaves. And later on we read in the, in the uh, New Testament, Jesus says not only cancel the fig leaves, but curse the fig leaves to die because self-righteousness will get you nowhere. It has to be the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so what God does is he gives them clothes. And the clothes that he gives them is made of skin from another animal. The first people sh that should have died should have been Adam and Eve. They should have got just dosed. They should have just got dead. God should have just killed them. But God did it. What he did is he killed these other a these animals and made clothes and gave it to gave it to Adam and Eve. And that's very, very significant. Because what God is saying, what God is saying there, this is something that's called types and shadows. There, there are things that God does in the Old Testament, and later on in the New Testament, He kind of amplifies it and kind of explains to us why He's doing these things. And even though they were they were dead and they didn't have this, they were naked, God clothed them. God gave them something to to kind of um, to have to wear, and um, not only just to have to wear, but God did this because He loved them. More than more than more than anything else that that he that he's ever created ever before. So he didn't want to just give judgment to Adam and Eve, but he gave the sacrifice. He, somebody else died, and because of that, clothed Adam and Eve. Now, in the New Testament, the Bible tells us in uh, Romans five seventeen, and this sometimes it gets kind of hard to read through this. Um, so I'm just gonna let's just read it together. Um, Romans five seventeen. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, and that's Adam. We just read what Adam did and what he did caused everybody to be, in a sense, naked without this clothing. And so because of what Adam did, everybody is messed up. Everybody deserves death, okay? Through the one Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, that's us, that's what we receive, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And so this is, let me just kind of like tie this together. I know my tongue was going to kind of uh, tie it up there. Because of what Adam did, he messed it up for everybody, okay? And he made this, this death just kind of came. Every single person after that was born with a dead spirit. We just talked about that, the, the three parts of us, that dead spirit. Because of what Adam did, everybody has, has this death. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, when Jesus came to earth, he brought this righteousness. And God says that he's clothed us with his righteousness. So when he looks at you, he doesn't say all the sinful parts, all, this, all, the, all the things, all the yucky stuff about us. He sees what Jesus Christ has done. And that's when we start to understand more and more who Jesus is. And that's when we get to see Jesus in all these things because... As these things are unfolding, as man is falling and, and creating all this sin for, for earth, Jesus Christ already knew what he was going to do and how he was going to save us. And so when we see God saying, like, yeah, I'm going like, to give them tunics out of skin. I'm going to give them clothes. In the New Testament, he clothes us. He clothes our nakedness. He clothes our shame. He clothes all of us with Jesus Christ, with this gift of righteousness, through this abundance of grace. And when we understand that, we just love Jesus so much more. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Because of what you have done. Not because of my own self-righteousness. Not because I read the Bible every day. Not because I go to church every Sunday. Not because I do the right thing and I pray all the time. Those are not the things that qualify me to stand in the presence of the Lord. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done that qualifies us to be sons and daughters of God. And that is amazing. So we just want to say thank you to the Lord. Praise God for that. Jesus is amazing. And so what we want to do at this time, all of you have a cup, right? And I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to um, invite Mark up, if you would um, help lead us to a time of um, worship now.
And uh, if I if I could ask you to um, just un just take off that that top lid. There's a little wafer there, and then you might want to um, peel off the, the the bottom one too, so we can have uh, for the juice. And if any of you don't have one, would you please raise your hand? We'd like to give one to you. Now, as we go through the stories in the Bible, every story in the Bible kind of unveils, or it really does unveil a certain part of Jesus Christ and who he is to us and how good he is and what he's done for us. This morning, when we, we read about sin that entered into the world, we understand that Jesus Christ has an answer for that. And he gave it already. He's already paid the price. And what we do is we receive that gift. We receive the gift of grace, the gift of righteousness that was found in Jesus Christ. And because of what he did, he's taken upon all of our sins and it has in fact become sin for us so that he could impart righteousness into us. I know sometimes those words are hard to kind of understand and that's why we, we want to continue to just um, gather together so that we can have a clear, complete revelation of what Jesus Christ has done for you because he loves you that much. Now before we take communion, I want to ask you to just um, follow me in a prayer. And um, I'll just add the words and if you would add your heart, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I receive your gift of forgiveness. I receive your grace. And I thank you so much. I know that I have sinned and I also know that you have taken upon yourself all of my sins. And now in response to your grace, I have faith in you. I believe in you, Jesus. Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. And now, church, as we, as we hold this bread together, this bread represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for you. And when we partake of this, this, this bread, we remember the body that was broken for us. We remember Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. So let's eat together. And this juice represents the blood that was shed for you. And because of that blood, we are now under a new covenant. The old covenant of following the, the Ten Commandments has been demolished, and now we fall under this new covenant of grace. And everything is based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. So when we drink this, this wine and this juice together, it reminds us that we are in this new covenant because of the blood that was shed for us. In Jesus' name.